Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to take you through our future video presentation uh, this morning. Um, the work we're showing really started as we were looking at um, developments uh, with display technology. Um, and as we were looking at what was going on, we thought we might be too far away from a time in the future where it would be possible for consumers to have a large, high-resolution uh, video display in their homes. It would be relatively affordable. Um, and we've made a prototype using today's technology rather than tomorrow's technology. Um, unfortunately, that was all that was available. Um, and so it's large and high resolution, but it's not really affordable by consumer standards. These are professional displays, LED backlit LCD. And we've got a bezel width of about five and a half millimeters between adjacent screens. But with OLED, it's possible to make a display that has no visible bezel. And so we think in the not too distant future, you'd be able to tile a wall, giving over whatever area you're prepared to give over um, to make a screen. It would be seamless, um, very high resolution in your home. And assuming that's going to happen, we then thought, well, what does this mean for the TV experience? How might it evolve and adapt to take advantage of that kind of display? We thought there were four key principles that would, that would, that would be significant. First is we'd want to make it blend in and be as unobtrusive as possible. With today's large TV, when you go out and buy one, there's kind of a implicit tension between what it looks like when it's lit up to display beautiful pictures, and then what it looks like when we switch it off and screen turns black. Most of us like the pictures, not everybody likes the big black object in the corner of the room. So we think you're going to need to blend it in and make it unobtrusive to be accepted. We we'll want to show pictures in an appropriate size, and that doesn't always mean filling the frame as we do with television today. Um, we think that comes down to how you emotionally relate or engage to the content you're watching. And I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. Um, it'll be ultra high definition. Each of these individual displays is 1080p. So we have nearly 6,000 pixels horizontally just over 2,000 vertically. And of course, we can use that to display 4K Ultra HD content. But we may also want that resolution so that we could show HD or lower resolution content at a smaller size, but still be able to resolve all the detail in that content. And lastly, it will be ambient. And by that, I mean that when we're not sitting down to watch a TV program, we would probably want to use these displays to show other personal information and content. And I can show you some examples of that. We might have some live news headlines just cycle around and update automatically. We might have a clock, some live weather information, a uh, family calendar. We might have some family photos that I'd just like to put up on the wall. Just simple examples of, of the kind of personal content information you might want to put up, and I'm sure you can think of many more. Now I'm using an iPad to control and interact with this system, but this is just a web app running in a browser. Um, we could be using Android devices, um, laptops, uh, netbooks, smartphones, tablets, whatever devices we have around the home that have a browser and Wi-Fi can pick up this web app uh, and we can use it to interact with the control system. And as I look at the display on this web app, you can see at the bottom half here, I've got a representation of what's being laid out on the screens in the environment. Our large side screen, our main screen here, and we've got a, a small screen being driven by this set-top box. And I can tap on each of these content items It'll bring up information. Uh, in some cases, it might bring up a web link that I can click through and go out and find more information. And I can drag things to move them around. So I might take those family photos, for example, and move them over here. So, as we're here to talk about the future of video, perhaps we should watch some video. Um, let's take a look at some breakfast TV. So this is our HD breakfast TV content, and you can see around there uh, our broadcast has editorially chosen to place some extra content. Here's some information about the program we're watching. Down here, some live news headlines. This is broadcaster's RSS feed being rendered beneath the video. And on the companion application, if I tap on the area where those headlines are, I get a web link. I can click that, go through to the broadcaster's website, and read those stories in more detail without impacting on the large screen experience. Now in the introduction I was talking about not always wanting to fill the frame with video and show pictures of an appropriate size. We can easily change the size here with a control that we call the immersion control. If I tap on the video, we can bring the immersion up. That video will fill the display and we'll lift up the audio a bit as well. Now, I don't know about you, but as I watch this with our life-size news readers staring right at us as they're reading the audio cue, it can feel a little bit intimidating, perhaps a little bit confrontational. If not now, then perhaps certainly before we've had a cup of coffee first thing in the morning. So we might contend that that was a, an inappropriately large size for that kind of piece of content. But we think it comes down to how you emotionally relate or engage with that content, how immersed you want to be. 
you might be quite comfortable with that size. And as we look at some of this contribution to the news programs, you know, the technical quality clearly not very good here. And again, you might not really want a picture of that quality blown up to such a, such a large scale. But with our immersion control, it's easy to change. We could have a very modest presentation of that video if that's how we wanted to experience it. Let's bring it back to a medium level here. And we'll notice as the program transitions into the weather segment, that area underneath where we had headlines is updated, again under broadcaster control, um, to reflect what we're seeing in the video. This segment of the program is sponsored, so we have a sponsorship graphic there. If I tap on that area on the companion device, again, I get a web link and I can find that. We go through to the sponsor's landing page, find out more information about their products and services. And as I skip us forward a little bit further into this program again, into the travel segment, we'll see we've got some live travel information. And of course that could be personalised to reflect my location on my journey to work in the morning. Now everything you're seeing here has been implemented in HTML5 and in fact each of our large displays and the uh, small display being driven by the set-top box over there um, is running in a web browser. In the room we've got one 5.1 audio system and it's connected to the, uh, to the host of the browser driving these screens but my other two uh, screens don't have any audio system attached. I can uh, drag the TV around just as I was dragging the other content around, content around earlier. I'll drag it over there. And as the video lands on this display, hopefully you can hear the audio is panned around to reflect its position in the room. Now, as I said, it's only this browser that's connected to the audio system, so that content, in fact, is still running here, but we've hidden it. And we've done some work to the AV pipelines for these browsers, um, so that as we play the same video in multiple browsers, they will be frame accurately synchronized. So we're hearing one instance, which has been hidden, and now we're seeing a second instance over here. The, way we've, the reason we've done that is we didn't want to have to keep introducing producing speakers or audio systems into the room for every set of screens that we bring in. And today you can't really buy a piece of consumer audio kit there and hope that input's coming from all those, uh, all those devices and set them up appropriately in the same way. So that's the way we tackled that problem. Now you may have noticed as this content moved around, it was relayed out to fit the different uh, shaped screens that we have over here. And also there was already some content there and that got displaced automatically. That's because we've got a layout engine that's sitting behind the apps running in these browsers and just managing the presentation of content across all of these displays. We're doing that to just try and make it easy for users to use. We don't want them to have to kind of manually resize things to make them fit. Uh, and if I want to move something in a particular place, we'll just move things out of the way for us. So we'll leave our breakfast TV there. Um, we can show live TV channels on the system. And I'll just bring one of those up now. So this is off-air satellite, just takes a couple of seconds to tune. There we are. I mean, we could put a simple visual experience around today's live channel. Obviously some SI data telling us what we're watching. We've almost certainly got some place captions or subtitles um, underneath. We can bring um, another channel in. Now I'm not suggesting that we'll always want to watch more than one channel at the same time, but there may be some situations where that's something you'd like to do. Sports probably a good example, being able to keep an eye on uh, the outcome of more than one game at the same time. Certainly during the Olympics last summer, it would have been nice to keep an eye on more than one event going on at the same time rather than having to zap between them the whole time. So immersion works the same way um, as previously, so if we want to focus on one program, I can drive up the immersion for that. And our layout engine there, resizing things and scaling content to make it fit for us. Just go to one channel here and just bring up the immersion. This may be a situation that's familiar to you. You might be sat at home watching TV in an evening, but the evening very immersed in what we're watching, maybe a movie or a documentary, and we get interrupted. This is my little girl Rosie, um, and unfortunately she does have a habit of interrupting our viewing from time to time, bless her. Um, we've got her baby camera in the nursery. Now, as it happens, I'm confident she's about to be looked after, so I'm going to be a little bit selfish and suggest we just go back to watching our program. Rosie's moved around to the side here by the layout engine. We can just keep an eye and make sure she's being looked after. Which is a relief because I'm not flying back to the UK to the city. Um, the point we're trying to make here is that as well as having broadband and broadcast content in the system, we can have content that originates in the home be it the baby camera, the security system, door entry camera. Our layout engine can be aware of all of those inputs and help us prioritize and manage 
um, when we get to interruptive. So that we're really only interrupted by the things we want to be interrupted by, especially when we're highly immersed um, in an entertainment experience. Okay, we'll leave that there. Um, what I'd like to do now is show an example of how a content creator or broadcaster might um, augment their video content to really take advantage of these kind of displays. So we have this year's NBA All-Star Basketball game to take a look at. So around the HD video um, as it went to air, here we've got a fairly rich presentation of some uh, in-game stats. Of course these will update as the game progresses, driven by a relatively lightweight data feed. Um, beneath we have a sponsor for the event Kia, and on the companion device, if I just tap on that region, I get a, a nice ad here and I can tap through uh, and get more information um, about those advertised or sponsored products. Over on this display, we've got our full-size player. The layout engine is aware of the physical dimensions of the displays in the environment and their relative position, and that gives us the opportunity to show content at one-to-one -one scale or life size. And we can interact with this on the companion app. If I tap on that player, I can scroll, and we can look at these different players. And you'll see for each of them, we're getting uh, some invitations, some call-outs here, the opportunity to buy tickets or buy merchandise. And within this app, we can tap on those links, and again, we'll go through to the website uh, where we can purchase those tickets. So simple examples of how you might monetize that extra screen space, use it for promotion or for drive purchasing, effectively introducing a kind of parallel advertising model alongside the video over here. Now our game's in progress and we find ourselves in it by default in a fully immersed state. But the broadcaster here is sending triggers alongside the gameplay so that as there's a break in play, as we see here, that immersion automatically is getting driven down for us. Um, perhaps a more appropriate time to be looking at some of this other contextual information which is not so much happening in the game. And as play resumes, you'll see that immersion gets driven back up to full for us. We don't have to um, have those triggers in effect. We can opt out of those if we want to be in control of the immersion mode. Just skip us a little bit further forward into the game. As we bring the immersion down here, we'll see that that presentation around the video is updated to a different style of presentation, here comparing the performance of two players. And again, we can interact with this. So if I bring up the application, I can start to drive the uh, live screen experience. Instead of comparing their shots, we could look at their team contribution, uh, or maybe compare their performance in defense, just different visualizations of stats there. Um, and if I wanted to pick a different player instead of LeBron James, we might pick Carmelo Anthony. So again, just another simple example of interaction. Now in putting this example together, we only got hold of the content and the rights to use it after the game had gone to air. So everything you see here was created as part of the broadcaster's existing uh, workflow. High-res player images came from the press kit, some of the other assets from their web and mobile production. But we didn't have the luxury or the opportunity to ask for anything new to put this together. Okay, I'm going to skip us forward one more time uh, in the game. And we'll notice we've lost our life-size player over here on the left-hand side. What we'll see in a moment is we're going to get an invitation <coughs> from some of our friends who are watching the same game in their homes um, to take part in a virtual shared viewing experience. So here's our invitation appeared on the wall. It's also popped up on the iPad, so we'll uh, accept the invitation and join our friends. <laughs> Today people often pick up the phone and chat whilst they're watching the same program and some people use these kind of devices to do a video chat. What we want to do is explore bringing that into the environment so it felt a little bit more ambient as if um, our friends were kind of watching with us. Okay, let's turn our attention to the evening. Um, think about a family trying to choose a movie to watch together. We were thinking about how we might support that kind of content discovery and selection process in this kind of environment. And we thought a nice way of doing that would be if our service provider or our content provider made available um, a set of movie poster images 
to reflect the movies that they had in their VOD catalog. We can put them up on the wall, they'll cycle around gently. If we see something that catches our eye, we can just tap through and start watching. A lot of movie posters are almost kind of works of art in their own way, and um, they, uh, they say quite a lot about a movie often being a synthesis or a composite of the ideas and themes of the piece of content it's about. So we're going to tap through and watch a movie, but uh, before the movie starts, of course, we have a trailer. there is irregularly shaped. Because we're freed from the constraint of always filling a rectangular frame, we've got a little bit more sort of creative opportunity to use different size and shape assets. <coughs> so this is our movie and this is in 4K resolution. Concept. We try to avoid compositing graphics on top of the video. 